Thank you. Well, Agnes, um, I have to congratulate you on being one of the best conference organizers and one of the best hostesses uh, that um, is around at the moment. Very, very good, very high intellectual standard, but also very collegial and friendly and um, um, a very relaxing environment. But um, the topic that you've been pursuing over the last uh, couple of conferences about the intermedial um, intermediality, of course, is very relevant uh, to um, the aesthetic problems, the aesthetic and theoretical problems that we face today. Um, when I was reflecting on a possible um, presentation um, for this particular conference, uh, <coughs> I chose Mark Lewis for various reasons. First of all, because uh, he moved into, uh, put it like this, he'd made a few films uh, in the um, first part of the 1990s, but he really moved into um, an exploration of film as a medium in 1995, which was the moment when of the century, which was the centenary of the birth of cinema. So he marked a very particular moment between. Um, a fascination with film and the ability to work as an artist in the gallery. So to try and sum this up, it was the moment when uh, digital advances made it possible for artists to work with the moving image and uh, 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 exhibit their work in the gallery. So in terms of intermedia, it was a kind of a very, very obvious, and we now know it's very um, embedded in our history, uh, crossover moment uh, between the two. But why I was interested in Mark uh, was that his um, his early films in the late 90s were not only using film as a recording medium, but also referring to the early history of cinema. And so questions of cinema, space, and time were always inscribed into his work as uh, um, a moving image artist. And this was his uh, fascination with the Lumiere single shot films in which a slice of time and a slice of space were just put together within one uh, image. Um, so I think that's a, a very obvious moment, but I felt that his work kind of, uh, captured it and um, had that mixture of uh, the, the cinephile and the exploitation of new technologies that was quite characteristic of a certain kind of intermediality. Then I was focusing on his work on uh, rear projection, <clears throat> which while in the same vein is very cinephilic and makes a strong reference to cinema, but actually is interested in the way in which the uh, film frame contains two different slices of time and space, which are put artificially together. The intermediality of it becomes uh, m much more complicated and also is referring to a particular film device that was used very much in Hollywood movies of the great, of the great studio system period and which had become archaic and obsolete with the coming of uh, different kinds of special effects, CGI, etc., etc., blue screen, green screen, um, and so on. Um, so this device had always been rather despised. Directors didn't specially like it. 
uh, people thought it was creaky, clumsy, and always a little bit obvious. So I think what interested Mark was that um, it took time for this clumsy, creaky, rather visible device to have an aesthetic, a new aesthetic interest. So it was only with the passing of time that, as Walter Benjamin might have argued, that something that had become obsolete can then be revalued uh, from a new historical and aesthetic perspective. And I think that that's what Mark was doing. And it was this added uh, uh, level of um, re-exploring an archaic, outmoded um, device that made his, late, his work with um, reobjection particularly interesting. When I was introducing um, the Mark Lewis work for my conference paper, I was also trying to angle it a bit in terms of questions of landscape and the picturesque. And so in that sense, I was using the Canadian landscape, Algonquin Park, as a site of possible um, uh, reflection on uh, the picturesque as a mode. I'm not quite sure how well that worked, and I'll come back to it in a minute. But because of the connection between Algonquin Park, Ontario, um, his connection with Algonquin Park in Ontario, I wanted to bring in the paintings of the group of seven as a backdrop to uh, his work in Algonquin Park. Um, um, so that's one level of painting. And there I think you could say that the works of people like Tom Thompson and Lauren Harris are actually a backdrop the a historical consideration. Otherwise, strangely enough, in terms of painting, um, Mark Lewis has always been interested in those paintings that seem to him to prefigure the movement of the, of the cinema itself. So one uh, way in which Mark Lewis has tried to associate painting and cinema has always been the sense that there was a pre-cinema that existed before the actual invention of cinema, that um, the idea of cinema was there earlier. And this, interestingly enough, was a point that Stephen Jacobs brought up in his uh, uh, Saturday keynote when he was talking about cinematism, cinematism as uh, uh, a word that sums up this sense that the idea of cinema pre-existed its actual invention. And that's why he has always looked particularly at paintings that had to do with time and movement, uh, of which one of the most obvious is um, the a Chardin painting of the little boy who's spinning a top on his desk and is watching it. So you have the spinning top, but you have implicit in the painting the moment in which the top was first spun by the child, but also the moment in which it's eventually going to, its movement is going to run down and the little toy is going to fall. Um, so it was the, that way in which a slice of time could be put into painting that Mark was very interested in. And that's, I think, uh, also where his um, interest in um, the traditions of skating, childhood skating, memories of skating, also fitted with his fascination with the Dutch uh, winter landscapes of people uh, skating on icy lakes, rivers, streams, etc. Et and so um, um, there's an interesting crossover there. I think perhaps a kind of genuine uh, 
what we might call an intermediality of the imagination, in that it's not an intermediality that you might, anyone might theorize. It's an intermediality that exists particularly in Mark Lewis's artistic imagination, which is to do with the tradition of winter painting, particularly with ice skating, and his childhood memories of ice skating, and the two skating, main skating pieces that he's made. One which is uh, Algonquin Park early March, and then the other was Nathan Phillips Square, uh, the Toronto ice rink, where he skated as a child, but also did his uh, second major um, rear projection work. Uh, one of the points I think that I realized when I was preparing this presentation on, on his work was the way, was how often Mark has gone back, uh, just to finish with this particular theme, has gone back uh, to childhood and children's games. He made a very beautiful piece in a, um, a council housing estate in London, which was one of the most beautiful housing estates of the utopian uh, 1950s when the London County Council was making free accommodation available for the working working people of London and this the Haygate estate in the Elephant and Castle was just about to be pulled down in an act of very very brutal and quite Philistine destruction so Mark took a very mobile camera and ran it through the walkways of the Haygate estate, but picking up at various different points, children playing with different kinds of toys, either a hoop, a football, um, bicycles, but children's games were inscribed, it was called children's games, was inscribed into the piece. So there again, rather like uh, the Nathan Square uh, ice skating piece, the relationship between his memories of skating in the great modernist square of Toronto, Nathan Phillips Square, and the lack of, and the loss of the realization of these modernist utopian dreams comes together with questions of kind of childhood and the hopes that children have for the future. I hadn't really thought about this before, uh, but I think it's a, uh, uh, a theme um, that, uh, that carries on, which is most particularly achieved in the phantasmagorical piece, um, Mar early March Algonquin Park, with the children skating in this absolutely remote landscape where no children would skate at all, which he's just kind of conjured up out of the kind of magic of that very, very complex zooming camera movement. But I would also just like to go back to another question, which is perhaps a more difficult question, um, but I might, I'll just have to address it through a detour into the conference, um, and which I hope will kind of link back. So I was interested in the paper that Jurt uh, Fogaracci gave uh, about um, English uh, uh, landscape, design around the great uh, uh, English country houses of the 18th century. Um, here he made the connection, I think very specifically, between the amateur, <coughs> between the amateur fashion for what was called the Claude glass, when members of the uh, uh, leisured uh, cultural bourgeoisie went out into the uh, English countryside and uh, um, um, s captured it, snapped it, as we might say, through the um, device of the Claude Glass, which they then as it were notoriously sketched and uh, in a, again, a kind of pre-photographic uh, mode, because very often the Claude glass is 
mentioned in terms of, again, a kind of pre-cinematic archaeology. But uh, he very specifically makes the connection into um, the way in which uh, um, a landscape designer like the famous Capability Brown would redesign uh, a piece of um, countryside and remold it, refashion it, so that it became a picturesque landscape. That was what his job was, that was what he was good at. So this was to find a position, a point of view, a bella vista, as you might say, from uh, a privileged point within the house, which could then look out and enjoy the picturesque vision of the landscape. Now, what this involved, which I knew, of course, and uh, but I think he made it very plain, was this very often involved moving the unsightly, and very often the unsightly would be a village, a working class, um, a peasant village, uh, where the people had to be just uprooted and moved away somewhere, their houses demolished, uh, and a river diverted to make a lake, and then various features like deer, for instance, uh, certain clumps of trees and so on were then introduced. So this is a, a very, very complex, you might say, a, a very um, elaborate mode of controlling vision in which the c control of vision was directed literally at the landscape, at the land itself. So you might say that perhaps if I was talking about the controlling vision of the male protagonist and the male spectator in my Visual Pleasure and Narrative Cinema uh, essay, which uh, characterized Hollywood cinema of a certain period, then you might say that this controlling vision characterized the, um, the ideological point of view of a certain class and a certain money class uh, at a certain time in history. And what Georges uh, George was saying so particularly was that this vision was a screen which concealed literally where the money had been, where the money had come from. So, in a sense, this was a a colonized vision. It was the vision of the early, very brutal days of uh, industrialization, which was totally invested in an image of beauty that would literally repress in the most Freudian psychoanalytic way uh, the actual um, ugliness of the origins of this capitalist gaze. Um, so I thought that was very, uh, 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 very interesting and very um, clearly put. Um, and this then, I think, takes us back to another question about um, rear projection, which I hadn't really thought of until putting these couple of things together and putting them together with um, Stephen Jacobs's presentation. Uh, as well. Um, one of the, uh, I was slightly concerned uh, in citing the group of seven um, to know how to deal with their vision ideologically. To a certain extent, the group of seven were, they weren't capitalists. They were, one of them was quite rich. I think Lauren Harris was. Um, this wasn't a capitalist gaze on the Ontario landscape, but it was a foreign controlling gaze on an occupied landscape. So there is, in a sense, something a kind of um, uh, something uncertain about it. 
uh, which I don't know enough to be able to analyze. And I don't know if it's something that one would necessarily condemn or if it was something that one would say was an interesting, perhaps naive, exploration of a landscape which is apparently uninhabited, but of course had been inhabited for centuries, centuries and centuries by the Canadian First People who are not acknowledged in these particular um, paintings. So that again brings us back to the question of the controlling gaze and I am agnostic on the question of group of seven. I don't really know what I, what I think. But to come back to the question of rear projection, uh, from this ideological point of view of discussing you know, the controlling power of the gaze, and particularly perhaps the controlling power of the cinematic gaze, because rear projection is broken, its control to a certain extent is um, implicitly uh, also broken. Because the screen consists of two different parts, shot at two different times, there's a pseudo perspective and a pseudo unity, which actually the eye of the spectator can perceive and that actually um, 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 doesn't manage to to convince, it doesn't create an adequate perspective. So to a certain extent, this broken perspective, this duality of uh, rear projection, uh, in a sense, undermines the controlling gaze. Its, uh, its time and space is too confused, uh, is too um, discordant. And this, I think, takes us back uh, to the very interesting points that, uh, um, that, that Stephen Jacobs was making about um, uh, Henri Stock's um, open window, where he too was picking up on this um, discordance between background and foreground. Um, in the Renaissance paintings that Mark was particularly influenced by. I wanted to uh, make the connection that uh, Mark had perceived in uh, rear projection, the discordance that I just mentioned in time and in, uh, in, in the lack of unity in the rear projection uh, screen, and how he was interested in the Renaissance portraits, the Renaissance sacred paintings that hadn't actually achieved the perfect uh, control of perspectival space. And here he noticed that you, that quite often, as, it, as in the Memling portraits, the subject is in close-up almost like the close-up of a star in the movies, and the landscape stretches out without any, con uh, without any spatial connection between the two. There's, as it were, uh, this beautiful detached landscape, dreamy landscape in, in the distance. And um, I thought that it was fascinating the way that um, Stephen Jacobs came back to that in his analysis of the Henri Stock um, um, open window film, which was about uh, uh, which was about landscape, but particularly picking up the way in which beyond the open window exists this magical landscape, which is uh, out of um, spatial continuum with the interior. So once again. The, the, um, the question of the controlling gaze and the space of the gaze is uh, broken up into a, a discontinuity. Um, and very often with quite a different, well, 
almost always with a very different um, poetic reference between the foreground and what's happening in the background. Uh, and these little scenes of day-to-day -day life, everyday existence that are portrayed in the background is often somewhat at odds with the sacred or, um, um, or privileged nature of the foreground. I don't think this is, you can argue that this is so much the case in rear projection. In rear projection, they generally just put a moving image behind the stars that would make the scene adequate. Um, I, but I think there is a connection between the dislocations in time and space uh, that you can read across, uh, across the two. Uh, a lack of, um, of control and an interest in a minute eye of detail, perhaps, um, a more animated background. But I'd like to think about this further in the aftermath of this conference when I brought it up and Stephen brought it up and the question of the Claude Glass and the controlling glaze, gaze has been brought up in terms of landscape and I haven't really answered it in terms of the kind of visual pleasure uh, controlling gaze of the male protagonist. Um, so it's something I'd like to think of a bit more. But it just means that the aftermath of the conference, um, and yes, is just as, is continues to be very rich and thought-provoking and rolling over, as it were, into the future.